What's up, everybody? Coming to you live from my parents' house at completely odd hours of the night. No, coming to you live from my parents' house, we got episode 32 of the Changabi Show. Those of you that are new, welcome in. Those of you that are old returning customers, it's good to be back. Week off the Changabi Show, little week off of uh, of taking shit a little serious. Uh, did an after show last week, but I missed I missed doing the research. I missed doing the work, and frankly, I have quite a lot to talk about and a lot to share with you guys today. So I'm really really excited to be back. I'm excited to be off the layoff. But before we you know get into some of the serious stuff we're talking about today, let's get into how I'm feeling because I'm egotistical. And if for those of you that are returning, you know I like to talk about myself. It's what I do 98 percent of the time. No, I don't do that. I try not to. I, I, I've tried, you know, I've t- I, I talk a lot about myself um, and I've been given this opportunity to do so by, you know, having the internet, by talking to my, talking a lot about myself. So I try to do a little bit less of that and try to be, I'm trying to be co- more cognizant of uh, trying to listen to other people and you know, be more empathetic because I'm just genuinely, I guess, not an empathetic human. No, I'm kidding. Okay. Uh, now to talk about myself, <laughs> how are you doing? Um, so I took a week off last week and I took that week off. Uh, I guess I, I figured I would use the beginning of the, of the show to kind of explain why I took a week off. I guess I was feeling really just routine. Uh, and I was feeling like very, I was feeling very robotic. I felt like I'd lost a little bit of the art of podcasting, if that made sense, the art of creating a show for you guys. And it just, just, you know, in and out. And it, it felt, it felt more robotic than anything. And I felt like I needed a little bit of a change up. And that combined with the fact that I fell sick last week really helped just kind of shake things up in a good way, in a really good way. I I'm, I'm glad it happened, uh, in the way that it did, because it allowed me the chance to sort of take a step back for the first time in about 10 months and really reflect like, yo, you've done 31 episodes of the show. They've gone, some have gone good. Some have gone fantastic. Some have gone terribly. Uh, But what is the sum of all of that? Like where, where, where are you as a creator? Where do you want to go as a creator? And what can we do to, what can I do to make this uh, podcast, make this experience a little bit more enjoyable for you guys? And also like, what are, Maybe like, what is, what is some stuff that I should focus on? Because 31 episodes, I mean, we're not getting the view. We're not getting a hundred views an episode yet. So I can't tell you that I have a lot of people, you know, listening to this. So what, what is a way that we can get more people tapped in and what is a way we can continue to build a community? I mean, these are just all things that I was thinking about over the course of the week. Um, and I think you guys are going to see kind of slowly within the structure of the show that things are going to change. Things are going to change within the format of the show. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying new things, trying to new, try new things at a wall and throw things at a wall, see what sticks. Uh, and I hope you guys support me on that journey. And if you don't like, let me know if you guys like what you see, feel free, express that as well. Like I'm, I'm down for whatever. Um, But my vibes, uh, they've been good. It was a very restful week off, uh, you know, recovered a little bit from a sickness. Uh, But after that, it was good to just kind of uh, really get back to what I like to do, which is just research stuff. And I found some really nerdy topics. I found some really fun topics that I feel like people are going to like on this episode. So I figured, why not just get right into it? Because nobody wants to hear about how my break was. And I, I talked a little bit about I lo- I talked a little bit about it on the after show. I talked a little bit about it here. Uh, I'm feeling better. I'm feeling rejuvenated. I'm feeling ready to go. So let's get right into the show because Sirius Chingavi is back. If you're on YouTube, you know exactly what that means. So let's get into this, right? I'm gonna update you guys on a story that we did. We I did this story two weeks ago. Uh, for those of you that don't know, and uh, and for those of you that remember, I did this story about two weeks ago, uh, two three weeks ago when March Madness was in full swing, and I did a story about the probably America's sweetheart uh, of the month uh, last month in St. Peter's University, and I did a whole story about their basketball program and how they overcame like incredibly improbable odds to be where they are today. 
uh, to, be, to be where they are today and to make the run that they did in the NCAA tournament. For those of you that are unfamiliar with St. Peter's University, basically what happened was their basketball program squeaked into the NCAA Division I basketball tournament, their men's team, and they won a game against Kentucky and they continued to win games and basically got into the Elite Eight, which is which means you're one of the best eight teams in the country in the tournament. They eventually lost, but they made a huge run into the Elite Eight. And basically, a lot of the players on that team became national celebrities of sorts. So when we last talked, we kind of left off with St. Peter's had just lost the Elite Eight game. They had gone on this awesome run. They'd overcome all of these uh, obstacles that comes with being a Division I mid-major team, et cetera, et cetera. <sighs> and the day that I actually recorded that episode, their head coach, uh, their head coach this year, Shaheen Holloway, actually left for Seton Hall, which is seen uh, in New Jersey. For those of you that don't know, Seton Hall University is seen as like the much more coveted job. It's like the no- it's the number one uh, or one of the top basketball schools in New Jersey. And so Shaheen Holloway, you know, left because he got a much better opportunity at Seton Hall. Can't blame him. Uh, and so that was where we sort of left this story off. But a lot more has happened since Shaheen Holloway left. Uh, and I thought, and I thought I would update you guys on what's been going on with St. Peter's. So the last we talked, I thought, and I was saying on the record that I thought it was going to be a lot of his players. Uh, uh, I thought a few of his players would enter the transfer portal because they would get other opportunities. And I thought a lot of them would follow suit because they loved their head coach so much. So they would follow him to Seton Hall University. But actually, none of his players followed him, which is interesting uh i don't think it says anything about him as a coach but it's interesting to see that uh none of his players really did follow him to seton hall uh one of the players we talked about in that story was a guy by the name of doug eater uh doug eater was the star of saint peter's off the bench this year um during the tournament in particular he was the first one out of all of the players to announce that he was going to enter the transfer portal which he did and since then Uh, He announced that he would be attending Bryant University, which is a small school in Delaware and a small mid-major program, uh, mid-major Division I basketball program. So basically what I'm trying to say is Doug Eater didn't really make uh, an upward move, in my opinion, when it came to uh, him and his college basketball career. That being said, on the outside, it may look like a lateral move, but also on the inside, we had no idea what his interest was like. We had no idea who was interested in him. Uh, we had no idea if anybody really wanted to uh, pick up Doug Eater, uh, particularly the bigger Division One schools, because the fact is he was a bench player on a 15 seed team that made an improbable run. So there wasn't a lot really going for him besides the fact that he was sort of the tournament darling of a lot of things. But anyway, uh, Doug Eater has since uh, transferred to Bryant University. So that's where he's at right now. Uh, then the Daryl Banks and Matthew Lee were the two other stars with St. Peter's. They also entered the transfer portal and have left St. Peter's, although we do not know where their next destination is going to be for either of them. I believe they're probably still looking at their options and still trying to figure out where they want to go. Uh, Doug Eater did announce Bryant University, like I said earlier. Daryl Banks and Matthew Lee were kind of unidentified uh the star senior on the team kc and defo uh who was a senior this year this is their uh forward slash center uh he is going to be looking to the nba draft this year he's announced that he has declared for the draft and is going to see what his options are uh in terms of his draft eligibility to be honest i'm not quite sure where he's going to be drafted i'm not sure at what position he's going to be drafted i think it would be somewhere lower uh definitely not a lottery pick for sure uh, i would say maybe late second round is where casey and defo is looking at uh for his nba draft prospects but i'm not a draft expert i don't pretend to be that's just where he has announced that he will be headed after this year My main takeaway sort of, though, from all of this, from all the player movement, uh, moving to different schools, moving into the transfer portal, moving even into the NBA for the case of Casey and Defo, my takeaway of of this is St. Peter's will never happen again. The core of last year's St. Peter's team is gone, all but gone. A lot of them, you know, for various reasons and uh, for the fact that a lot of them have gained the publicity, they moved on for bigger opportunities and you can't fault them. I understand if you're a St. Peter's basketball fan, you're upset that a lot of your favorite players are gone and are moving on, but 
they're moving on to bigger and better things and and they're doing what's best for them and you can't fault that you can't fault them for anything but that's the truth honestly of many sports stories and unfortunately it's this way for the saint peter's program uh the school does really well they exceed expectations they're a mid-major program that made improbable odds to reach a certain point and the the people who were a part of that core are leaving that sort of mid-major underdog program uh, to ex- to explore bigger opportunities. And the mid-major and St. Peter's University at the end of the day is the loser. They they gained all sorts of publicity after, you know, the the great rise of these of this team and how well they did in the NCAA tournament. But the reality is a lot of the the, the core is gone. And we're not going to see that core uh, try and take it home again this isn't the nba where you can sort of uh incentivize people with money this is still college and people are still trying to build their careers and i've i I really want to stress this point i've been stressing this over and over again i want to stress it again you cannot blame the coach you cannot blame any of these players because the reality of what they're doing is that they're doing what's best for their career they are doing what's best for the opportunity that they were given they had a fantastic opportunity because they made the elite eight and so now they're doing what they believe is the uh, most uh, lucrative opportunity for them financially and for their basketball careers, respectively. So if you had the question in your mind that St. Peter's could run it back, maybe be a higher seed, maybe in a different form. Maybe there'll be new stars that form on their basketball team next year. Maybe they still will be uh, one of the better teams in their mid-Atlantic conference. But the reality is the core with Doug Edert and Shaheen Holloway and Casey and Defo and Daryl Banks is no more. And so they're going to have to do it in a different form with a different head coach, with a lot of different players and a different system. The St. Peter's that we know and love from this year, from this tournament, we'll never see that again. As sad as it is, that's the reality. I know it's a little bit sad of an update, but the fact is, I mean, if you're a sports fan, you're kind of used to this, particularly if you're a college sports fan, because a lot of your favorite players in college are constantly looking out for themselves. And that's not something that you can aid on. And, and the reality of the situation is simple. You're trying to, you know, shift gears and move on. That's that is what it is. And if you're not a sports fan, it's it's just the reality of the business. It's it's you know, you're looking out for yourself. You can think of it in a corporate sense where you're looking out for the next promotion, the next uh, company that's going to advance your career, looking out for uh, your opportunities for to advance yourself and maybe potentially get into a position where you're achieving your dreams. That's, I guess, the way that I would like to put it. But that's the update on St. Peter's. And yeah, that's <laughs> that's all I got to say about them. But listen, we talked a lot about St. Peter's. And we talk, we're talking about college and we're talking about the college age. So let's, let's talk about partying. Okay. I I know I've talked uh, at length about various things in relation to college and, and that is a fact, right? Uh, But I've, I've been thinking, I I was thinking this past week when I was, you know, on a little bit of a break, I wasn't partying during this break because I was sick, but while I was sick, I was thinking, I was like, damn. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people have varying college experiences. And I would say, I would say that a lot of people in different generations have a varying college experience as well. Uh, it's not necessarily, yeah, I would say that someone who is a Gen Z student isn't necessarily having the same experience as uh, a kid who partied as a millennial in college. I, I, I just think that's, that's an opinion of mine. I've, I've seen kind of partying shift and change based on the way that trends in the alcohol and other substance markets have changed. What is my point? What are you trying to say, Amuj? Okay, here's what I'm trying to say. I feel like there's a new craze. There's a new hype and there's a new hype alcohol right now. We can't not acknowledge it. I will talk about it later. It's called hard seltzer and the rise of hard seltzer and white claw and truly, which are the two main brands of that brings about this whole new set of questions in regards to Gen Z's substance consumption habits and their values. So Anuj, what the hell are you saying that hard seltzer is taking over the market? Let me explain. The beer market has consistently declined and I've done a lot of research on the numbers of the beer market. So let's get right into it. The reality is there's a lot of people in my age. Right. And I I talk to a lot of people my age because that's just my age group. And these are the people I hang out with. I don't hang out with people really above my age or below my age. So a lot of people my age say you talk to them, you talk to them in the streets, you talk to them just hanging out. 
and and they hate the way that beer tastes. It's the reality. You talk to a lot of people who are around the ages of 18 to 23 and and most of them are like I fucking hate beer. It's disgusting. It's gross. There's listen, there's there's a minority of people that definitely love the taste of beer and I would say that I'm in that minority, but a lot of people don't really like beer all that much. They drink it to get drunk or they drink it because, you know, uh, it's kind of it's it's got that social capital value. Not a lot of people really like beer. Um and of course, but I've you know, of course, there are some people that love it, but a lot of people who I've talked to have had like this is tends to be the story of the people that I've talked to. I talk to people and they're like, I had there was this one time I tried this beer that was in my brother's fridge or my cousin's fridge and it was an IPA or it was a dark beer and it sucked and it tasted like shit and it tasted like piss. And so because of that, I refuse to ever drink beer or I really have a really bad experience with beer because it tasted so bad the first time that I really refuse to try it. So a lot of people have had these really unfavorable experiences with beer. And this isn't just one person. This just tends to be a lot of people that I've discussed beer with. And the fact is the market share is changing. Not a lot of people. The, the narrative of marketing Bud Light and cheap beer was once super lucrative to market it to college students. But now when college students aren't necessarily digging the taste of beer anymore, th- it's changing dramatically. There's almost a need for a new type of quote unquote cool alcohol. So now you have these like sweeter drinks that are more sort of tailored to the taste of a younger generation who, well, let's face it, guys. What did we grow up on when we were younger? It was like, what has been the constant reality of Gen Z? Ch- obesity has grown in this country. Okay. Why is that? Because this generation, this younger generation has grown up on sugar. They've grown up on more sweets, on more sugar, on more desserts, and they've had access to sugar probably easier than ever, easier than any other generation. But there's also a variety of other reasons as to why hard seltzer and white claw have taken over. One of the main things is the, let's talk about the pandemic for a second, because the pandemic has had a huge impact on the way that we consume alcohol. The other, this is the factor is that the decline of beer is partially due to the fact that independent breweries right now in the United States of America are struggling. They're struggling during the pandemic in 2020, people probably assumed like there's a lot of people out there and I, myself included until I did the research, assumed that the alcohol industry kind of thrived, right? A lot of people were drinking. Uh, a lot of people were at home. They were buying alcohol. So there was there was this assumption that there was a thriving alcohol industry. But the reality is simple. The bigger brands, the Bud Lights, the Coors, the Coronas, whatever you drink, did really well. But the small time brewery owners, you know, the ones you go to the bar and you try their house beer on tap, they did really bad because they thrive on you going and visiting the bars. They thrive on people going out, on people partying, on people trying their house beers for the first times at tap rooms or at bars, whatever. Those independent breweries struggled to remain afloat. And actually, you saw a 9% decline in overall market share for beer and in craft beer, which is the most that has been seen really in the modern era since it's been tracked, since the statistic has been tracked in 2020. And the flavor of beer has been cited by craft breweries as well as breweries to being one of the main reasons and uh, to being one of the main reasons of it not fitting in. A lot of people have been, a lot of craft brewery owners have been quoted by saying like they struggle. They've been struggling because a lot of people in the younger generation don't relate to that flavor and aren't necessarily like drinking a lot of beer because they don't like the taste of it. And it's come, this is sort of one of the reasons that we have come to this time now that there's this alternative alcohol. The people are looking for what is the next big thing? What is the next thing? But listen, we can't not talk about a change in partying without talking about the rise of a completely new substance. 20 years ago, marijuana in this country was illegal. Now today, marijuana is legal in over 18 states and in a lot of different cities around the country. It's the elephant in the room. Is drinking simply not as popular anymore? It's a fair question. Here's one of the other realities. We continuously are living in a country where marijuana is consistently getting legalized day by day in different cities, in different states, and alcohol now is suddenly not the only substance that you can consume legally 
to get quote unquote lit or to have a good time because marijuana and cannabis is competing with it. And they all, they both have different effects on different people. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but it's preference. Now you have options. A lot of people in Gen Z, actually, I've done surveys on this on my Instagram, by the way, at the Changabi show, if you'd like to participate in the questions of the night, a lot of people in Gen Z really do prefer smoking weed. A lot of people, there's there's studies out there that say there's a lot of people in Gen Z that prefer smoking marijuana than to drinking alcohol, and they put marijuana as their substance of choice rather than drinking for a variety of reasons. Some people feel a little more chill on it. Some people like pot because it, you know, it, of the way it feels. Medicinal marijuana has also become more popular. There's a variety of reasons. I'm not, the, the marijuana concept of this is uh, a whole separate topic, but listen. Drinking is still considerably popular with the American population. Nearly over 60% of the American population partakes in it on some level. But the thing is, the introduction of cannabis is introducing this shift in partying and is introducing this change in partying that perhaps we have yet to see. Because, I mean, legalization of cannabis had started, what, 2017, 2016, 2015? We have yet to see the long-term effects on how a party is going to look maybe 15, 20 years down the road when marijuana continues to be legalized throughout the country. But we also live in a generation that is very open to the idea of clean living and clean partying. This isn't, you know, the 1980s, the 1990s where you're just scarfing down beer. You're just, you know, drinking whatever's in front of you to get drunk. A lot of people in this generation and with this younger people are cognizant of nutrition. Nutrition and health have become a huge part of American life. It's become more out there. I'm not saying everybody is healthy. I'm not saying everyone is super health conscious, but there are a lot of people that are conscious when in, in the drinks that they're consuming. You know, beer causes bloating. There's a lot of different things. That's why the no carb Bud Light beer has come out. The 100 calorie Miller Light has been super popular. There's a lot of these things. There is sort of this idea that you need to be kind of in a clean living, clean partying type of vibe. And there are a considerable number of people who are looking at alcohol and trying to be more nutritious, I guess not nutritious, that's not the right word, but trying to be more cognizant of some of the more nutritional facts uh, and what's going into their bodies. So let's cue the hard seltzer. And I feel like in honor uh, of this topic, I have earned the right to open this White Claw pineapple flavored. We are not sponsored, but White Claw, hit us up at the Changabi Show everywhere. Cheers. So, okay, next question, right? Cue the hard seltzer. The hard seltzer has sort of become this alternative alcohol, so to speak. So, Anuj, what, what is the hard seltzer's role in the market? Good question. Hard seltzer through their marketing, has really pr started promoting laid-back partying and, and chill vibes. That's what they've been going for with White Claw in particular. You look at their branding, you look at their marketing, that's where they're headed. And the, that sort of message has spoken to this Generation Z that seems to be a generation that's leaning less into the hard partying, keg stand partying, and more so the chill kickbacks, you know, talking and, and hanging out type of vibe. Less alcohol content sparked with more flavor seems to be where Gen Z wants to head in regards to their drinking. And White Claw and Truly are two brands in particular that are really focused on being sort of more approachable with their taste and being in, in an environment that's comfortable for everyone. Best way to describe White Claw is someone who hasn't drunk White Claw, by the way. It's basically like LaCroix. It's sparkling water uh, mixed with a little bit of the flavor uh, and alcohol, of course. So it's it's kind of like that. And speaking of LaCroix, I think one of the reasons why White Claw has become so popular is because of LaCroix. It, LaCroix in this generation, for some reason, I mean, I guess it has to do with like the vibe and the aesthetic of LaCroix being this kind of healthier, or not healthier, but just like a new alternative to water and sparkling water making this comeback. And, and White Claw sort of being the alcoholic version of LaCroix, the popularity has risen along with uh, the way that sparkling water has as well. So listen. We've we've talked about White Claw and Truly and all of this stuff, but how have they become popular? White Claw and Truly, I mean, frankly, their their branding has a lot to do with young people because 
for a long time, these types of drinks, White Claws, uh, wine coolers, sort of not like alcoholic drinks that were sweeter were considered ladies drinks. Like in the 90s, in the early 2000s, a lot of people would look at these drinks and be like, ew, these are for girls. But YouTubers like Trevor Wallace and really like Churdley's, honestly, like to their credit, have used White Claws in videos. They've made it a big part of it. And I mean, they weren't sponsored by White Claw or anything, but like they shifted the culture more to this like a concept that like white claws can and all of these like non or these different sorts of alcoholic drinks could be broy too. It's not just beer all the time. And they made white claws like quote unquote cool to college kids. All of a sudden it wasn't just, you know, girls drinking in at parties. It's guys. Guys prefer this stuff. There's like interviews that are done. Like if you had the choice between a white claw and an IPA with like frat boys, like what would you pick? And a lot of them pick white claws now. And it's because of the aesthetic with alcohol. When you sell alcohol, you're selling vibes. And that's the real. It is raining so hard. I'm so sorry. But when you're selling alcohol, you're selling vibes. And that's the reality of the situation um, that's going on here. And I discovered White Claw in college. And I thought it was cool because it was, a, it was an alternative to beer. It was a nice change up. Like, I love beer. Don't get me wrong. But, like, drinking a White Claw uh, was definitely a, a nice change up. And I also just really like the taste of it in general. Okay. But here, I mean, the, the numbers during the pandemic were just so inflated, right? A lot of people were drinking. A lot of people were trying new stuff. And the numbers have taken a hit in 2021. I'm not to say that. But let me talk a little bit about a personal experience in regards to seltzer. My dad <laughs> was completely unfamiliar as to like what White Claw was uh, until I came home for COVID, right? I came home two years ago. And I started buying White Claws at the store. You know, my dad would be like, oh, let's get beer. I'm like, no, like, let's, let's, let's get White Claw. Like, he's never tried this before. He's like, what is this? Like, this is going to be terrible. And then he started trying it. And it basically, like, slowly became his go-to drink. So much so that there's a lot of beer that sits in our fridge that's undrunk. But White Claws go like this in our household because it's become this sort of go-to drink in our fridge. It's light. It's fun. It's... Uh, it's just a, it's a good summary drink. It's very good for California weather. It just works. And the sales numbers have reflected that in 2020. I mean, seltzer outsold a lot of beer companies. It became the new thing. It became the new thing so much so that companies like Coors and Bud Light came out with their own seltzers. Eventually, obviously, seltzer has become, you know, the oversaturated market that it is today. But the fact is seltzer is the new thing. And seltzer is promoting this new age of partying which is really, really interesting. And I feel like whether we like it or not, partying and Gen Z is shifting the conversation of what partying looks like. It's not uh, so much so this reality of, oh, like it's just drinking at the keg stand and chugging shots and all of these things. We're looking at a different vibe. We're looking at different partying and it's due to a variety of reasons. Like I discussed, maybe a little bit due to marijuana, maybe a little bit due to us being a more healthy generation, maybe a little bit due to us, like looking for a new taste in our alcohol. I don't know. I don't know, but these are, we're seeing a change in partying happening right now. And I think we're seeing a, a look into new alternative alcohols that could perhaps shift the industry and shift partying in general. Uh, just something to think about. And it was something I was thinking about a lot about. I did a lot of research, looked into it. Um, and I've kind of found that seltzer has begun to take over during the pandemic. And it's become this message to of change uh, in partying to the American public that it's no longer just chugging beers and hard alcohol. There, there's other options out there and cleaner options that perhaps could be a little bit lighter on your body. Okay. Is seltzer, I mean, listen, seltzer could potentially be a bunch of hype, right? I'm not here to say that it's not, it's just a, you know, it's going to be here to stay. I mean, we, we've seen sort of the seltzer market fizzle out. It has gotten to the point where like companies like Coors have shut down their seltzer brands because they've lost a lot of money. The Topo Chico uh, hard seltzer brand, which is Coca-Cola sort of hard seltzer wing has lost a lot of money, lost more than it's gained. That's why they're really going aggressive on the advertising budget. There has been some drop off since 2020 for sure. And it's not like projecting the aggressive growth that maybe we thought it would two years ago, but 
Seltzer is popular around the world. It's not just in America, but in Canada and Australia, these same numbers have sort of been reflected. And companies like Germany are developing different seltzers. I mean, you talk about Germany, which is supposed to be like the capital of beer throughout the world. Oktoberfest takes place there, for God's sake. And they are developing things. Um, uh, they are developing hard seltzers because they realize that this is a market that they could attract. So there is a lot changing. And they're definitely the party scene in the world is changing because Gen Z is bringing out these sort of new different types of alcohol. And I think it's interesting. I think it's really fascinating to see sort of how this whole thing is shifted. Okay, listen, that was a long topic. And we talked a lot about hard seltzer and that's fair, but there's a lot more to talk about. I have so many more things that I want to mention. And I was talking a little bit about alternative forms of alcohol. Uh, so why not talk about alternative forms in media? I've been thinking a lot recently, right, about content creating. And when we think of content creating here in America, we think of content creating within the content that we consume. What does what content does Unage consume? What content does so and so consume? My listeners consume. But a lot of us tend to be from the U.S., and so we listen to a lot of American YouTubers, American podcasts. Rightfully so, right? They're from America. But the other day, I was, you know, downstairs doing my thing, and I was seeing what I, my mom was watching YouTube, right, as normal Indian parents do. But, uh, you know, usually when Indian parents are watching YouTube, they're listening to old Bollywood songs or, you know, watching some YouTube explanation video about some recipe or some thing or whatever, right? It's just like, it's kind of, uh, there's a disconnect there. But my mom was really like, she was literally watching a vlog. And it was all in Hindi. And so I, I could, you know, barely understand it. But I was looking and I was seeing and I was like, she's basically watching a vlog. And I was like, I was asking my mom, like, what are you watching? And she's like, well, I'm just watching something. Like, it's not a big deal. But she paused the video and I saw it was by this guy by the name of Dhruv Rathe. I'm going to get into Dhruv Rathe a little bit later. But he, it's clear to me, my mom was watching like this vlog slash Q&A. And I was like, I watch vlog and Q&A videos. But she's just watching it in Hindi, and she's watching it made by some Indian content creators. So this is what it led me to think. I was like, listen, my mom watches YouTube creators now. It's probably a lot of other moms and a lot of other dads are watching YouTube creators now. Aunties, uncles in particular. I'm just talking about it in the sense of India. Like, our parents are watching YouTubers now. It's not just us. And it's clear that the content creator has expanded uh, the content creator profession and content creators in general have expanded to one of the world's most populous countries. I mean, of course, Anuj, no shit. Of course, there's going to be an alternative form of media in India. But it's there. There's this whole new movement, right? When you think of India, you think of overproduced Bollywood soap operas. But now you're seeing YouTubers and you're seeing like real vlogs and real shit being talked about. So let's see in what ways it's similar to America and different. Because I've done a little bit of research and I've found a few creators that I think you guys are going to find interesting. So let's let's go through it first. Who are some of the creators that are making it in India and what are their names? It's a fair question. Let me go through it real quick. There are three main creators that I'm going to be talking about today because these are the three that I've had the most familiarity with and the ones that my mom watches. So I kind of tended to watch those videos with her and I also did my own additional research and they happen to be very popular YouTubers and podcasters and content creators within India. So here are the three I'm going to talk about today. Sejal Kumar, Dhruv Rathe, and Ranveer Alababia. Okay, these are the three big, the three ones that I know of, and three of the three of the biggest, bigger content creators within India within this alternative movement. So, I mean, most of you are probably thinking, like, isn't it mostly Bollywood? Aren't like I have conversations with my cousins, I listen to what my relatives are talking about with pop culture in India. A lot of it is Katrina Kaif and Deepika Padukone and Ranveer Kapoor and all the Bollywood actors. I mean, fair, right? But it has been like that for a long time. And there has been a lot of this conversation surrounding Bollywood and surrounding these films. And, and that's fair. It's a billion dollar industry. There's a lot of money that goes into it. And well, frankly, the popularity and the numbers are, are there. A lot of people still really resonate with Bollywood. But now look at this. There was this guy by the name of, Sh I, I'm not going to, you know, go too much into detail about this because I don't really know that much. And I, frankly, this uh, topic is not about this particular thing, although we could make a topic out of it. But there was this whole nepotism scandal back in 2020 uh, with this guy 
this Bollywood actor by the name of Shashant Singh Rajput, who committed suicide due to uh, basically not being able to get a lot of roles due to the fact that Bollywood is an incredibly gay kept industry. And there's a lot of nepotism going on, blah, blah, blah. There's a whole, you know, I, I obviously, I didn't do this topic justice. I didn't really explain it well. Uh, but there was this huge backlash of Bollywood that basically people started to realize like, holy crap, like nepotism is so big in this industry that it's literally leading people to like, who are self-made actors to like kill themselves. And it led people to have this whole new look at Bollywood. And it led people like my mom, who was like a really avid Bollywood movie watcher to look for new forms of content and look for new content creators that are making Indian content. And that's kind of where these new YouTubers sort of insert themselves as being uh, a different sort of role to take that on. So political YouTube, right? What is like, what does political YouTube look like in India, right? We know what it looks like in America. You have guys like Ben Shapiro, you have guys like uh, John Favreau, um, Steven Crowder, you know, who are, who are talking heads and basically talk a lot about the, uh, the different, um, political agendas that people have. And I'm sure India has their fair share of BJP heads who are constantly talking good things about the BJP. But the political YouTube scene in India is actually really cool. And it's headed by this guy by the name of Dhruv Rathe, the guy I was mentioning earlier, who was uh, my mom was watching that blog of. Uh, Dhruv Rathe. So Dhruv, let, let's give you a quick background on Dhruv Rathe for a second. Dhruv Rathe is a 27-year-old from North India. Uh, and he has made it his job to basically be one of the main voices of the of India's young, politically active sort of generation, right? Uh, you you ask a lot of Indians. Actually, it's it's pretty ironic that like Narendra Modi is super right winged, but a lot of younger Indians do support him because of the fact that uh, he because of like they just there's a lot of young people that support Narendra Modi, but Dhruv Rathay is not one of those people. Um, he's gained a huge following through several years. He has over 7 million subscribers on YouTube. He's doing really, really well. Uh, based on the way that he's presented a lot of information about hot topics and about uh, various political issues that are going on in India and the way that he covers them. He lists out all the facts and then he gets into his opinion. And it's a very di digestible way of listening to headlines and listening to the news rather than listening to the news in India. For those of you that are familiar with some of the news that goes on in India, uh, cable news isn't necessarily the most healthy thing to listen to if you want to be educated. If you want to be educated about current events in India, it's the truth. Um, and Dhruv actually does most of his YouTube videos in Hindi because he realized that 80% of the population in India doesn't speak, uh, I mean, they speak broken English, but they don't really understand it to the full level. And so if he speaks in Hindi, he's able to reach these people in rural village areas that perhaps wouldn't be able to access that information if he were to speak in English. And so he speaks, all his videos are done in Hindi so that all people of India can sort of be, uh, can access the information and can understand what he's saying, uh, on, on the same, on a similar level and a similar playing field that, uh, that he would like. And so your next question is probably, is Dhruv Rathe controversial? Listen, Dhruv Rathe is an incredibly controversial YouTuber. I put up a little question on Reddit saying like, what are your thoughts on Dhruv Rathe in this like Indian subreddit? Half the comments were, this guy's an agent for other political parties. He has an ulterior motive. He's against Narendra Modi and the BJP. All he's trying to do is destroy India. Like a lot of, you know, bullshit. And he is one of the most controversial political voices in India because of the fact that the BJP is so overtly liked. And also the BJP does a lot in making sure that speech is censored from a lot of other political parties. It's gotten really, it's gotten so bad for Dhruv Rathe. His, his following has grown and his videos have grown. And it's gotten so bad for Dhruv Rathe that police reports were filed against him for defamation and they were threatening to throw him in jail back in 2018. He had like several police reports filed against him and it led him basically making a to making a YouTube retaliation video, pointing out line by line about how those police reports were wrong. In fact, it's gotten so bad that one of the reasons that he decided to move out of India was because of security reasons. And now he lives somewhere in Europe, as he says, uh, but people say that it's Germany. Uh, I think it's I think it's revealed that it's Germany now. But uh, he tried to keep his uh, location pretty secret for a while. But he's remained in Germany, Germany, partially due to the safety reasons of returning to India. Uh, although he has made a visit back to India. But his wife is also German. 
Uh, and so he's sort of decided to settle in Europe as well. Uh, so that could also be one of the reasons. Uh, just putting that out there. But why is the Ruve important? Who the frick is this guy? Why should you care? The guy in America, the girl in America, who's listening to this through their phone or through their laptop. Why should you care about Dhruv Rate? Who the hell is he? Well, for one, he is one of the few people in India that when this country is going through the political turmoil, not turmoil, the political drama that they're going through, he's covering the issues in a really fair and giving a different perspective and opinion and not really caring about what other people think. He's going against the grain, which is something that I think India desperately needs. They need a voice that isn't, you know, going with the majority. And especially with their political climate being the way it is, you need people like Dhruv Rathe to keep the BJP and Modi sympathizers in general in check. In addition, Dhruv Rathe is really one of the first social media stars that India has had in a really, really long time. And what I mean by that is he's someone that just grew through YouTube. It wasn't like a case of a Bollywood actor who grew through a massively popular movie. Dhruv Rathay is through social media. He's through YouTube bread and butter. He's one of the few voices that is really trying to dig and find the incompetence within the Modi government. And there's a reason he's developed the following that he has is because people find him to be fair. People find him to be honest and people find him to be a credible news source that's providing information uh, to all sorts of people in India, not just the educated city dwellers, but also the people in rural villages that can also listen to him because of the common language that they have. Um, and he's expanded into different parts of YouTube too. He does travel vlogs, he does Q&As. My mom was watching a Q&A of his the other day. He's doing great and he's killing it. He's one of the first YouTubers that I have seen based out of India. Now he's not really in India, but like an Indian YouTuber that's like, doing super well on the platform. And of course, there's probably many that I don't know of, but Dhruv Rathay has really uh, become sort of the voice of these Indian YouTubers, uh, at least in the political space. But there's other spaces of YouTube as well. We all know this. There's different niche communities. And there's actually a wellness side of YouTube too. So let me introduce you to Ranveer Alabadia. Ranveer Alabadia is a podcaster more so than a YouTuber, but he's also on YouTube. And he's really one of the first podcasters to go mainstream in India. And it started with his fitness and sort of other takes in regards to his wellness and self-development and all of these things. He started with this signature quote uh, that he has called, basically what he says is he is the entrepreneur of the self, which in short basically means that you have to take care of yourself before you can worry about the external businesses, uh, external business that's going on, whatever bullshit has happening blah, blah, blah. Take care of yourself first. And one of the things that Ranveer has done that's really cool is he he in India is bringing up topics that no one dares to talk about. I mean, he's talking about masturbation in YouTube videos. You you say the word masturbation in India. If I'm, an, if I'm a kid with like Indian parents living in India, I'm getting the shit slapped out of me if I even say that word, right? And he's talking about videos. He's bringing on experts, doctors, talking about this stuff, talking about sex, no fap, men's mental health, really like conversations in India that people would just be like, <laughs> yeah, but I'm not talking about this. Even my mom was talking about how like, he's talking about like really specific issues for Indians that are just, you know, that pinch a nerve and that he doesn't care. He's willing to go there and he's willing to have those discussions. And it's made him become one of the more popular podcasts in India. Uh, he's got a podcast, like I mentioned called the Ranveer show. It's become one of the most popular podcasts in India. Uh, Ranveer, I mean, he's had guests in India uh, of like huge popularity. I mean, he's had Priyanka Chopra on his show, who's popular here in the United States because she married Nick Jonas. He's had people like A.R. Remahan, who is a massively famous music producer in India. And they've all been on the show and he's talked with them about, about a lot of taboos that are going on in Indian society. And fun fact, Ranveer actually had Dhruv Rathe on his show. So my mom had this like huge mental revelation of like, oh, like, oh my God, both of them are on the show together. Like, they're so good. It's so good. Uh, so he's done that podcast as well. Um, but listen, like, are there other just social media influencers? Is it like serious? Is it just serious YouTube in India? Like Ranveer and Dhruv, like, you know, Dhruv doing politics and current events and Ranveer doing wellness. Of course, there's social media influencers in India. Let me bring in my girl, Sajal Kumar, into this conversation for a second. Women are making it in YouTube in India too. And I want to make that clear. Sajal Kumar is one of the first lifestyle YouTubers on, on the platform. And she's sort of turned it into a business. 
now she's an actress and a musician and all of these things as well. But she started out on YouTube kind of doing fashion YouTube videos and vlogs and all of these things. And she, there's a really good interview with her and Colin and Samir where they sort of talk about her journey and how she's uh, become one of the OG kind of creators in that field uh, in regards to content creating with fashion and all of these things. Um, and she's, she's really good because she, she does a lot of videos, uh, based in like women's fashion, but also women's modern fashion, because in India, there's a lot of cultural context and a lot of cultural barriers in regards to like what women can wear and like what women can say. And she's sort of breaking all of those walls down by like, uh wearing whatever she wants she dyes her hair she gets pier she gets piercings wherever she wants like that type of thing and so she's very progressive in that mindset and breaking those sort of barriers and ha basically allowing for conversation to be had uh, and she's got like a million something subscribers on youtube too so she's very popular um and the but the thing is like this probably leads all of this is great Right. And you guys are probably asking the question, like, does the culture in India allow for creating, like allow for self-employment to be like looked at a positive light? And the answer is no, not yet. I don't believe that India from the research that I've done and from the people that I've listened to and from the interviews that I've listened to with these creators, I do not believe the culture in India right now is conducive to being like a, a culture that just embraces self-employment and content creating to a mass extent. But at the same time, you look at guys like Dhruv Rathe and Ranveer Alabadia and Sajal Kumar who are changing the creator economy in India. And it's becoming more and more common that there are YouTubers and that there are there is an alternative form to make it in media in India besides just Bollywood. And there's the good part about this, though. I mean, they may not be supported by their mothers and fathers uh, for a lot of them. I mean, the Ranveer has gone on the record and talked about how his father is not supportive of his podcast and his content creating career because he talks about a lot of risque topics. Um, but the good part of this is that there's a really strong subculture of creators forming in India with a lot of people who are just really into content and really into making videos and creating stuff and that are pushing each other and supporting each other. And I think that's really great is that there's a community forming of these guys lifting each other up and of creating this sort of alternative form of media. And why should we care? right? Living in America, living in a first world country, like that's India. They're separate. You know, they're 3000 miles away. They're across the ocean. Why should I care? Because India is the third most populous country in the world and is soon to be the most, or, sorry, they're the second most populous country in the world. And they're going to be the most populous country in the world very, very soon. Okay. YouTube is changing in so many ways. And there's a whole entire global audience out there that we lose track of. And now there's a bunch of people in India who are starting to vlog, who are starting to create content about fashion, and there's a complete change. We're seeing a huge change in alternative media happening in other countries, not just the United States, but in India as well. And I think that there's a certain level of authenticity and newness that is going to come, and there's going to be a certain level of new ideas and cool stuff that's going to come out of India that we're going to see on YouTube, and it's going to be really freaking cool. I can't wait. And it's already happening. I mean, through Vrathe and the Modi government, I mean, the fact that they've already seen him as such a threat that, they're, that there are people releasing fucking police complaints against this guy. Like, shit is changing. And the global perspective, like, I always believe, I've always had the belief that everybody should have a global perspective. You shouldn't just be caught in your California mindset or your United States mindset or your Canadian mindset or whatever, wherever the hell you're listening to this from. You need to expand to the whole globe. And that's what I really want to do on this show is global perspective is key. And if everybody wants to understand the full perspective of media and the way it works and globalization, all this shit, you got to understand this alternative India movement that's going on right now, because it's an India media movement, because there's a lot of cool content creators going on in India that are pulling off a lot of really cool stuff. And uh, I think you guys would be really interested to find out some of that stuff because it's really, pre it's really freaking cool. But let's transition. And I want to talk about this next topic really quickly because there's a new show that I want you guys to check out, right? Everyone is always looking for new TV to watch. And huge, what is the next show? What am I supposed to watch? I'm bored. I mean, you could watch all this content that I gave you. It's in Hindi. You could turn on the closed captioning for uh, Ranveer and Dhruv. I think Sajal does a lot of her videos in, uh, in, in English. But for Ranveer and Dhruv, you'd have to turn on Hindi. Anyway, what is the new show, Anuj? Shine some light on a show. Give me a show. 
Let me give you a show real quick. Here's a show that's not getting a lot of love and didn't really get a lot of love when it came out in the first place. It did for about a couple days and then it disappeared. So let me talk about it. Let's talk about the flight attendant for a second. What is the flight attendant in the Break this show down in 90 seconds. Let me do it. This show, the flight attendant is what it's called. What is it about, Anuj? It's about a flight attendant who, for lack of a better word, gets involved in some frisky business and gets caught up in some stuff that she probably shouldn't be and is forced to clear her name and her reputation from the forces, from the external forces within the show. Okay. So why why should I watch this? What is what is going on here? Well, essentially, I think you should watch it because her occupation is, well, a flight attendant, like we said, and a lot of her job involves her traveling and going all around the world to different stops. And so there's a bunch of different stops within the journey and the show is moving. The show also tackles a lot of issues in relation to substance abuse, estranged families, mental health, and a lot of other really deep stuff within the fabric of the show. Who's in the show? Who are the stars? Give me the stars, Anuj. I need to know the actresses of this show. Okay. You remember Penny? You remember Penny from the Big Bang Theory? The blonde one? Yes. Kaylee Kuko is her name. She's in this show, and she does a really good job. Another person. Have you seen White Men Can't Jump? You remember Rosie Perez? Yep, she makes an appearance and she actually becomes a pretty important supporting character in the entire show. So she, those are the two main quote unquote stars that I think you guys would recognize. So if you like any, if you like Rosie Perez, you like Kaylee Kuko, I think this should be the show for you because they both do a really good job of acting. So let me explain real quick why it's good. I think this show is quite good because of how fast it moves. I love the way that the show is constantly going 100 miles an hour. From the jump, it's moving. It's going quick. Everything is moving fast. It snowballs. It continues to go, 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 go. A lot of shows in this day and age move really slowly, and they take a while to develop. Kaylee Kuko's performance, I believe, in season one uh, is probably some of the best acting that I've seen from her uh, in her career on television uh, compared to whatever she did as Penny. And this it's worth watching because she does a really good job in this show and her performance is quite fantastic. So I would watch it. Also, if you need more reasons to watch, let me list them off. It's got murder. It's got sex. It's got drugs. And it's got fashion. So if you're into any of those four things, you'll probably like this show. Um, there's something in there for female and male viewers alike. So it crosses over quite nicely. Uh, season two is also going to be start releasing soon. I think they've started releasing episodes today as I'm recording this episode. So it should be all out. Uh, or the first couple episodes of season two should be out. So you'll have a little bit of time to catch up on that first season so that you're ready to go for season two and you won't be watching. You won't have to wait like I did for a year. Um, and you'd just be watching, you'd go right into it. You go right into season two. There's no cliffhanger, no nothing. Um, and so I don't know. I just think also it's a really unique show. It's a show you could watch with your parents. It's a show that you could watch with your siblings, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, friends, your dog, whatever. Like it's just the show that you could watch with everyone. It's a fun one. It's a mystery. It's got all sorts of different elements to it. And I think uh, a lot of people would really enjoy this show, the flight attendant. Where can you find the flight attendant? Real quick, you can find it on HBO Max. You can find it on Hulu with the HBO attachment. Uh, and basically anywhere that you have HBO, you can find the show. It's pretty readily available. So if you have HBO on any sort of content, you should be able to find the flight attendant. That is the truth. Okay, so an itch. We talked a little bit about pop culture, so let's get into music. Let's get into the bay, because I love the bay. I love the yay area, and I know I'm 53 minutes through the show, so I'll do this topic real quick, and then I'm going to have to do another fucking part two to this, because my computer's about to die, as it always does. The hyphy movement. What the hell is hyphy, dude? Listen, kids where I grew up, the, one of their main citations uh, when they say they don't like the Bay Area is that, it, it, particularly in the South Bay, is like, there's no culture in the Bay. Everyone's just academically oriented and into tech and CS majors. No one likes the Bay. The Bay is so stale. I hate the Bay. It's got no good music. Okay. First of all, that is the most baseless bullshit take I've ever heard in my life. So let me get right into it. You want to say there's no culture in the Bay Area? You are completely wrong. So let me shine some light on the origins of hyphy. Of hyphy music. What the hell is hyphy, Anuj? 
What the hell is hyphy? Hyphy, which also stands for hyperactive, can mean rowdy, lit, uh, you know, partying words, hella fun for those of you that are into that. In short, the hyphy movement, what it is, is it's a sound. And if you're from the Bay and you actively listen to the music around here, from around here, you know when it's hyphy. You know when it's hyphy. When it, you know, makes you bounce a little bit, when you start to dance the same way. When when the beat, basically what it is, the goal of the hyphy movement is that it's a beat on a hip-hop song that makes you want to, like, rock your head back and forth and dance a little bit, you know, dancing a little bit in my seat. Like, it makes you it makes you want to move. When you listen to a hyphy beat, you kind of want to move. And really, the hyphy movement, I mean, the foundations of it started in the 1990s. There's a whole history behind it with, like, Keck the Sneak and the Oakland rap scene and all of that. But it really started to come out for real in the early 2000s. One of the main hyphy albums that's listed is the album called My Ghetto Report Card with E-40, E-40's album. And to Bay Areans and those people who were around at the time, it's a lifestyle. It's not just the music. Uh... It's, it's not just the music and the sound, but there's so many different elements to it, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Hyphy, in, in short, is a tone. It's very in your face. It's very direct. The flows are like right there. They're unique. It's a very unique sound than anything you've heard in rap. And E-40 and Mac Dre are really two of the people that have made this sound sort of as popular as it is. Um, you listen to songs like Yay Area and Gasoline by E-40, Choices, which was a super popular uh, TikTok song, like the, no, yup, that song, yeah, that's hyphy, that's hyphy. Um, those are just the more like nationally recognized songs, I would say. Uh, and it's a sound that really resonated throughout the Bay Area. Uh, so for those people that grew up during the hyphy movement, the mid-2000s, you know what I'm talking about. I did not grow up during that time. I've just done a lot of research and I sort of know like what's going on. I've also listened to a lot of hyphy music growing up with a brother that's a rapper. You kind of are surrounded by that. So really what it is, it's, it's a merging of all kind of styles of music around the Bay and a lot of rappers brought that together. So why is it important to the scheme of the rap music industry overall? The foundations of hyphy, uh, like I said earlier, Mac Dre and E-40 and Too Short, are not only big in the Bay, but they're big all over the nation. They got countrywide recognition. Those were the three names that really, like, a lot of people... Like, when you say Blow the Whistle, everybody knows what that song is, right? Everybody knows the song, um, like, what's the E-40 song everybody knows? Like, I mean, the recent one is, like, I Don't Fuck With You with Big Sean. Um, but, like, Yay Area, Choices, like I said earlier. I just can't think of, like, E-40 songs that everyone knows off the top of my head. Maybe I'm actually stupid there are probably gonna be people in the comments that are like this this yeah i i just can't think right now but yes there are a lot of songs like the bay area rap scene forever changed because of these guys and the hyphy movement is based in a lot of modern day songs as well let me go through them real quick drake's the motto uh i know now she want a photo you already know though you know that song yeah that's hyphy that's based on hyphy that heavy drums you feel like the the you know, sonics, all the sound, that's all the hyphy sound. The whole song is actually a de in dedication to sort of that style. I mean, he has a bar in the song, rest in peace, Mac Dre, I'm gonna do it for the Bay. Paramedic with SOB, I don't fuck with you, Big Sean, hyphy vibes as well. Those are all hyphy songs. Listen, I'm gonna continue this on part two, so I'll be back. Okay, so here we are. Part two of the Changavi show. I told you. I kept my promise. I came back a full 10 hours later. Uh, fully rested. Fully ready to go. Let's get into it. We got two more topics, so I'm not going to waste any more time. Keep you guys here as limited as possible. Okay. The hyphy movement, right? We are talking uh, last I remember. Uh, sort of what it was in the modern day scheme of things. Uh, I believe one of the things I was talking about was the foundations of hyphy really are Mac Dre, E-40, Too Short, all of these people uh, who have not only achieved significance in the Bay, but also at a national and countrywide level. Um, and the Bay Area rap scene, to be honest, has forever changed because of these guys. And uh, like I talked about, I talked about Drake's The Motto. Uh, another song that I didn't really get to talk about last time, but I want to talk about now is Paramedic with S.O.B., on that Black Panther album. Um, 
it that song has such a heavy bay area influence to it with the drums with the beat and a lot of and a little bit of hyphy influence uh it's more of like a bay area song more than anything but like there is some of that hyphy influence with the way that the uh the beats go um i'm i know i'm really struggling to sort of find the words to describe what hyphy music is but if you've listened to like any bay area rap any bay area music you kind of know that bay area music is a very 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 unique sound to it and you can kind of tell it apart from anything it's it doesn't sound like the normal mainstream trap music it doesn't sound like um the rap like you may hear with j cole or kendrick or any of these people but it's very it's got very unique flows um it's got very uh it's got very sonically different beats that are just wildly different i highly recommend that you guys go check it out if you're into rap in any extreme and you haven't really listened to bay area rap it's definitely worth the check out e40 is the easiest way to go or mac dre or too short um there's of course a bunch of other bay area rappers as well but i'm no expert uh in this field but those are the three that i think like really do represent the hyphy movement on a more national level than anything else um i don't fuck with you by big sean is another song that really has a lot of bay area sort of influences to the song as well uh it's very uh, the flows are again in your face it's a very direct song it doesn't mess around it doesn't beat around the bush in any way sense of, of sense of the word but it does have a little bit of hyphy influence as well um and listen it may not be the hyphy movement may not be a movement that's necessarily well known outside of the bay right it's there it's still like uh, I mean, from what I know, it's still a Bay subculture thing. Like you either know it or you don't type thing. Not a lot of people know it throughout the nation. Like if you were to ask, unless you're like a rap music historian, like not a lot of people know. Like if you were to ask a casual rap fan, like what are the big spots of rap? They'd say like Atlanta is a big one at like L.A. and Houston, right? Those are the three or even Houston is still kind of a subculture. But those are like the three ones that are like really big, like the South and the West coast and then New York, of course, like hard, like New York and East coast rap and the nineties and all of that. So those are the three like really big ones. And the Bay gets kind of lost within the uh, overall culture of rap, but it has contributed to it in a wide variety of ways. So to answer the overall question that we had earlier, does the Bay area have culture? And the answer to that question to my South Bay kids who went to Kumon and missed out on their childhood is yes, the Bay area does have culture. It's not just Apple. It's not just what your parents exposed you to. There is a huge music subculture in this part of the country that is very unique. And my South Bay kids didn't grow up going to side shows or listening to E-40 or Mac Dre. Um, and that's fine. I mean, people grow up in different ways. I'm not hating on it. But there's a lot of culture in this area. So I thought I would take the opportunity to maybe educate people in the Bay Area and also beyond that we do have a significant music scene here that maybe uh, isn't promoted uh on the national level and high fee like i was discussing earlier isn't necessarily just related to the music although it is a huge part of the culture high fee culture itself uh, resonates to different parts of bay area culture and one of those being uh slang a lot of the slang that you hear in rap songs today uh has originated from the high fee movement and also has originated from the bay i don't know if people know this but like a lot of the quote-unquote like street slang hella being you know the most mainstream and famous all comes from the bay like the bay is the originator of all the slang you you hear bay area kids talk and this is like where culture and the hyphy movement sort of intersect you hear like a lot of bay area kids talk uh they talk in slang that's very very unique and they talk in slang that's very um uh different to other parts of the country i remember going to college and saying some words i remember saying like hella and like um for show and cop and all these things and like people were looking at me like you say that like what that's so weird like i come from the midwest we never say any of this shit and like we just we talk in very heavy slang in the bay area um and it's a very different way to talk i would say a different way to communicate um so slang is kind of one of the ways that i've seen the hyphy movement kind of grow uh, in a non-musical sense other ways, I mean, if you've ever heard of the thizzle dance, going dumb, like all this stuff is all originated from the hyphy movement and all phrases and all kind of expressions that come from this movement that has lasted for 20 plus years here in the Bay. 
this movement also, I would be, uh, I would be dumb to not mention this. Again, again, no pun intended, that the concept of sideshows and sort of like different cars and low riders and all of these things like comes from the hyphen movement. Like for those of you that don't know what sideshows are, it's basically like when uh, a lot of people gather in a side street or even sometimes a main road, but like late at night. And it's usually filled with a lot of like loud music playing and cars doing donuts in the middle of the street. And they're illegal in most parts of the Bay. But, you know, if you go to the right place, you can probably find a sideshow. But like cars are doing all sorts of things. People are dancing, having a good time. Um, you know, sometimes they can get violent, but it's it's kind of like that's the sort of culture um that has originated from the hyphy movement of just like going crazy in the street and just sideshows and cars and all of these things. Uh, I've personally never been to a sideshow, which is probably why I sound super naive talking about it. Uh, but I have seen pictures. I have had friends who have gone to sideshows and it definitely looks really cool. It looks really cool. And in San Jose in particular, it's like a huge thing. And also in other parts of the Bay area, I'm sure as well. Um, but sideshows are definitely a part of the Bay area culture. They come from the hyphy movement. Uh, and it's created this very unique street racing slash sideshow culture that not a lot of people know about. So I thought I would bring that up as well. And I mean, th the best way to describe the hyphy movement, if we're going to be honest here, is truly what the hyphy movement is, is it's one of those things like if you know, you know, um, and not a lot of people know. So uh, even like people who live out here in the South Bay or like in more kind of suburban parts of the Bay Area, they don't really know like what the hyphy culture is. Uh, it's just kind of one of those things. Do your research on it. Do some, you know, listen to some of the music because it's where you come from. And I just believe, I think it's super cool. I think it's a really cool underground thing. It's like uh, Bay Area is a little secret. So yeah, I thought I'd just shed some light on the number one secret, like the, the underground culture of the Bay Area that, uh, I mean, if if you know, you know, if you're familiar with rap and if you're familiar with the music scene in the Bay, you definitely know uh, what's up. I don't need to explain or educate you on this because it's it's very clear. Okay, so that's it for the hyphy movement. And I just thought, you know, and one last thing before we uh, before we transition out of this topic, like what are who are some of the artists right now that are encompassing like these high fee influences? Right. And I think that's a fair question if you want to listen to high fee music. So I, I made a little bit of a list. Uh, so one of the artists I really think is very high fee, very Bay Area is like SOB and RBE. SOB, RBE is like, you know, they made that song Paramedic. They have a song called Anti Calvin Cambridge. If you haven't heard, these are all very Bay Area songs. They go very in. Um, it's a subculture of rap. It's good music, good vibes, good time. Um, another artist that really does well with the hyphy, <laughs> hyphy stuff is uh, Miles Parrish. He he made not necessarily his newer stuff, but his older stuff. He's got this mixtape called Strangers Over Family or Family Over Everything, I think is what it's called. That's Strangers Over Family. Family Over Everything. Um, and that's pretty good. He's got this song called White Tea, which has a very, very hyphy beat to it and sounds it's it's got that very uh bay area flow to it as well e40 and too short like i mentioned a thousand times before in this segment definitely uh really good um really good influences uh for hyphy if you want to get into that as well 408 como of course i got to shout out my brother no but for real like he's he's the one that definitely like if i hadn't had him in my life i don't think i would be doing this topic right now i don't think i would have quite as much intrigue intrigue and information about this um, I would probably be talking about how I met your mother instead, but, but Kobo, my brother is definitely influenced by Hyphy. He grew up with Andre Nicotina, Too Short, E40, all these people and introduced me to them by proxy as well. Um, so if you want a new Bay Area rapper, he, he doesn't really have like heavy Hyphy influence, but, uh, he, he is, he does know a lot about rap. And so you could definitely hear some influences, uh, from the Hyphy movement in some of his songs. And lastly, uh, just most Bay Area rappers in general. I would say g Easy isn't really high fee, although his song Random definitely does remind me of that era. Uh, but a lot of Bay Area rappers uh, and rappers in general cite the high fee movement and uh, Bay Area music to be one of their main inspirations in their music. So I find that very cool. Uh, it's kind of like a, a cool thing within the rap culture that only certain people know about. And so I thought I'd bring it up to the mainstream if I could, uh, whatever the mainstream really means. Okay, listen, we got one more topic and then I'm gonna let you go here. Uh, 
there's a situation that's brewing in terms of the news, man. And I I know everybody wants to talk about Russia and Ukraine, right? And that's the the hot news topic right now. But there's been a huge political development in Pakistan that I would be um I would feel like I would be very negligent if I didn't mention it and talk about it right now. So let's do it. Listen, there's a unique situation that's brewing in Pakistan. And what is that situation? So let me explain it in a log line real quick, and then we'll break this all down. So basically what has happened is Pakistan, as you guys know, is a nuclear powered nation. They have tremendous access to a lot of nuclear weapons. They're everywhere. um, And there's a lot going on with that. And basically, this nation just voted to kick out their prime minister from office. His name is Imran Khan. You've maybe heard of him. But they voted, uh, the parliament basically casted a vote of no confidence, which meant that, which is a part of the parliamentary democracy of Pakistan and of parliamentary democracies across the world, where you can, uh, where your parliament, I think it's like a two thirds vote, uh, can vote to kick out the elected prime minister. And they voted, the the, pri- uh, the parliament basically voted to do that. They voted to kick out their prime minister of office from office, Imran Khan, using a vote of no confidence. And he basically left. So he basically was forced to leave. And this is a huge deal. This is an absolutely huge deal. Why? Well, Pakistan's nuclear has a tremendous amount of nuclear resources and they're immensely, they're, in a, they're a much more powerful country than you probably think they are. And so let's explain deeper. Like, how, why did Imran Khan lose power? How, how did we get to this point where Pakistan is now has a new prime minister within a matter of a week? OK, so there's a couple key characters that I think you guys should know uh, for the story. I think one of them is Imran Khan, who was the ousted prime minister, the prime minister that uh, was voted out of office. There's Shenbaz Sharif, who is the new prime minister uh, that took over after the vote of no confidence took place to kick out Imran Khan. And the Pakis- and the third uh, layer to this whole situation is the Pakistan army, uh, is the Pakistani army. And the Pakistani army, you may be wondering, like, what the hell do they have to do with anything? They're not political. But the influence that the army carries in Pakistan in particular is huge. They, the Pakistani army has had a huge influence over politics for about 30 to 40 years since the country's... Uh, for a really long time, uh, the people look to the generals to be the leaders more so than the government, because uh, that's just the way that influence works in some parts of the world. And the army has a tremendous influence in Pakistan, and they have a huge influence in this story. So you can kind of see where this is going. Um, so how did we get here? I think this is the key question everybody wants to know. So some of the reasons that were cited for the vote of no confidence include uh, uh, against Imran Khan. Uh, basically include economic mismanagement in Pakistan, mishandling of the country's foreign policy in Pakistan, and uh, a lot of things. I mean, Pakistan's been undergoing an economic crisis for quite some time. When Imran Khan was elected, he promised to really focus in on that economic crisis and make sure that that wasn't going to be the case. Sorry, it's really bright and it looks super foggy, but the sun just started shining. Anyway, um, but those were some of the reasons, economic mismanagement and uh, a lack of handling, uh, a good handling of foreign policy. Two things that Imran Khan said he really wanted to focus on and really make better. Uh, so this is the first time in a, quite a while that Pakistan has actually used democratic means to kick out a leader from his position. Usually, th- this has happened before in Pakistan where leaders have been taken out with no confidence. But at the same time, it's led to soft military, it's led to military coups, military action, and basically the military took over the government. So it ended up being a much more violently escalated situation. Right now, we're looking at a more very soft military coup where the mi- military had a huge influence in kicking Imran Khan out. But at the same time, they never had to really exert their force, which is very interesting. It's a different tactic comparatively to the other times that the military has used um, their sort of power. Uh, they've, they've more, like, usually the military flexes their muscle more heavily. Here, they've kind of let the politics do the talking. So it's, it's really strange in this sense. Imran Khan um, entered a situation when elected back in 2018 with a pretty weak economy of Pakistan. Uh, obviously, with the pandemic and COVID and all of these things, it's continued to sort of go down uh, a really bad route. Uh, and uh, the best way to describe the Imran Khan's approach to the economic crisis in Pakistan is he took to he chose to take short term gains rather than combat the foundations of the economic crisis. And so that eventually led to 
uh, a short, like that eventually led to growth in the short term and happiness for a few years, but eventually it all sort of started to crumble down and people started to realize that. So now what's Imran Khan doing after he was kicked out? Imran Khan is fighting for his political life. He's been hosting a lot of rallies throughout various big cities in Pakistan. There have been a lot of people who had its support uh, and his rallies have been big. And one of the main reasons that Imran Khan is citing for this uh for this, what's it called? Uh, vote of no confidence is that he thinks America was against him the whole time. He thinks the United States of America has had a plot uh, and has had agents within the Pakistan uh, parliament that want to kick him out. And this was their whole idea all along. Uh, this was this was the reason that he cited several journalists and also uh, various analysts and government officials have gone on the record saying that Imran Khan is, you know, it's a stretch and it's definitely uh, something that he's using to, for lack of a better word, cover his ass. So what is the tension going on right now? What What's the vibe? How are we feeling about in How are the people feeling in Pakistan? So, like I said, Imran Khan has gone on the record in these rallies and basically tried to blame the United States for being an agent of change in their po in Pakistan's politics and all of these things, and that there's a U.S. backed conspiracy, blah blah blah. So, where, but like, so if he's saying all this, where do the American and Pakistani foreign policy relationships stand right now? You have an ex prime minister that's going on the record and saying these things and could possibly be elected in 2023. Uh, based on the support that he's getting, where where is the American America and Pakistani foreign relationships at? Where where are we at right now? Most credible sources are actually rejecting Imran Khan's claims and saying that it's like I said, it's a lot of bogus. It's he's just trying to save face. And this is the weirdest part is that Imran Khan's criticisms of the United States have intensified. They weren't like this. Actually, if you talk to a lot of people uh, and read a lot of articles, you see that Imran Khan in the early stages of his uh, prime ministership in a uh, prime ministership tenure in Pakistan was very open to working with the West. He was very open to working with Western countries. He was having meetings with President Trump at the time and uh, Trudeau in Canada, a lot of people. And he was open to sort of Westernizing Pakistan. And a lot of people were very like a lot of Pakistanis abroad, as well as Pakistanis in Pakistan, were very supportive of that, that he was opening up the borders and uh, really trying to, instead of making Pakistan an insular country, expanding outward, which is which was uh, something that I guess people were looking for there. Um, and so he had met Donald Trump. He was he was working with the United States. But now that relationship has sort of shifted to a more hostile approach to the U.S. because, I mean, we're seeing some of the stuff that Imran Khan is going publicly and saying. And he's slowly, instead of working with countries in the West, like the United States, Canada, UK, whatever, is working with countries like China and Russia. In fact, he's publicly, uh, he when he was a prime minister a few weeks ago, publicly defended Russia over the Ukraine over the Ukraine crisis. So he's been working with uh, the more uh, sort of ostracized powers, for lack of a better word, with China and Russia rather than working with the Western powers like he was early in his prime ministership. So that's been sort of an interesting trend that we've also seen. Um, everyone's kind of shocked, I would say, is the general vibe that the army didn't get more military involved, militarily involved. I mean, usually in Pakistan, when there's been a crisis like this, the, mil the military has been quick to flex their muscle and has been very quick to make sure that uh, their opinion was heard by uh flexing militarily and taking over um for a little bit at least before the uh, transition to power so this has been a relatively tr peaceful transition of power with like a undercurrent of tension is the best way to describe it um but i'm of uh, just the belief that this is an important story to cover because of the fact that any country that has nuclear weapons that has a leader that's voted out of no confidence is huge particularly a leader that was relatively popular in Imran Khan uh, and relatively popular within uh, the Western countries, as well as in Pakistan in general, even though there, there were these issues that were going on uh, economically and with uh, foreign policy and all of these things. So what is the situation like right now, today in Pakistan? What is the situation like? To be honest, it's quite tense. Uh, there hasn't been any violence, but there's a lot of political under tensions and undercurrents that are going on that's very under the surface and is not really being talked about. Um, Shenbaz Sharif, like I was saying earlier, has taken over the position of prime minister. He's assumed responsibility for now. 
Uh, we'll see. He's got a lot of problems, obviously, to deal with on his plate. We'll see if he continues to uh, just stay. Like if he continue, if it continues to be a peaceful transfer of power, or it's you know going to eventually lead to something uh, a little greater. If Imran Khan's got a retaliation, it's weirdly it's weirdly positive. So I feel like this is why a lot of people aren't talking about it because there's no like military violence or there's no like death and there's no murder or anything like that. It's been a pretty peaceful transition of power um but a shocking one nonetheless and a lot of people like I, I mean i think the general vibe is that a lot of people are shocked the military didn't get involved uh and imran khan has hit the election trail hard he's going to try to re-campaign for 2023 i believe is when pakistan's general elections are in the august of 2023 so he's going to continue to uh personally attack the pakistani military as he's been doing and attack the united states as well as um the ruling party uh because his party basically got kicked out after you know he was taken out of office so he's continuing his personal uh attacks and trying to get back to power will he get back to power i mean only time will tell we will see uh he he does have a decent amount of popularity within the country so it's going to be very interesting to see what the re-election looks like so but honestly this is one of those things that's kind of like an instant reaction right he was kicked out of office the got the shenbaz sharif has officially presumed power of prime ministership in pakistan this is just going to be one of those things that develops over time we're going to find out more information we're going to see if imran khan continues this sort of momentum and tries to really take back the power um of trying to uh what's it called if he really tries to take back the power and continue to become a uh a i lost words sorry but if if he continues to become a uh, power or if he if he continues to want to become an uh, an elected leader once again um it's a very tricky situation very tricky waters to navigate but we will see what happens with the situation in terms of my opinion i don't really have an opinion on this uh quite honestly Imran Khan, uh, from what I knew, at least in the four or five years uh, of just being like talking to people and talking to people, what I mean by people, I'm talking to like uh, Pakistani friends of mine, Pakistani uncles, aunties, whatever. And they they were pretty pro him. Um, but, you know, obviously there was issues under the surface that maybe weren't being talked about as well. So we will see how this whole thing develops and we will see how this whole thing goes because it's interesting. But anyway, that's it for the show. That's it for part two. Thank you guys so much for sticking with me. Episode 32 is officially in the books. If you guys like the episode, feel free to like and subscribe to the channel. If you guys uh, are listening to me on Spotify, feel free to hit that follow button to get notifications for when a new episode drops, anything new drops on Spotify. Uh, if you're on Apple Podcasts, feel free to leave me the five-star review. Um yeah, all that stuff, all good reviews, good vibes. If you guys liked it, uh, feel free to leave a comment saying what your favorite part was. Just interact with me. Uh, and if you want to follow me on social media, I post a lot on Instagram and TikTok, trying to be better on Twitter. All my links are down below, so you can feel free to hit the follow button on all different social media platforms. Um, follow me there. It's a lot of fun. I, be, I, uh, I post a lot of clips. I engage with people who uh, are commenting and having a good time and arguing with me about my various takes. So that is all I have. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate every single one of you that tapped in and tuned in to the very end. Um, and yeah, we'll see you next week and I'll catch you for an after show, uh, probably Monday or Tuesday. So yeah, that's all I got. Appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. That's a new Chingavi signing off from the Bay Area, episode 32 of the Chingavi Show in the books. Peace.